Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm also a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Um, We talk a lot about Brazil and China in this podcast. We recorded before the news broke that China and Brazil have reached a deal to ditch the dollar as an intermediary currency and to trade directly with each other in their own currencies. Um, That's a big deal. It's not a big deal in the sense of Oh my God, the US dollar is declining as a reserve currency. If you've seen me uh, in person recently, or if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I don't think that that's the concern that we should have here. But in terms of the future of Brazil, in terms of the future of Brazilian Chinese relations and Brazilian American relations, this is a very important data point. Um, We've seen with Saudi Arabia, China's their most important customer now for energy. They're having to think about strategic and economic linkages with China. Brazil is is exactly the same. And if Brazil is going to rise as its own power, you would expect to see it to move away from the dollar to sort of think in terms of not just buttressing the Chinese yuan, but actually to buttress the Brazilian currency and to compete on a better level with U.S. agricultural exports to China, as an example, by using this currency trade mechanism and the political ramifications of China and Brazil cooperating in this level. That's also extremely important. So uh, we will probably address that more in the coming weeks. I might even put an, an in-focus piece out on, uh, piece out about it on the Knowledge Platform um, if you're subscribed to that. Um, but just want you to know we're aware of it. It happened after we recorded. We will, we will get back to it soon. If you're new here, my email address is jacob at cognitive.investments. Uh, write to me if you want to learn how to become a client of our research or of our money management, uh, or if you just want to tell me guests that should be on the podcast or you know want to tell me what you had for breakfast. All of it is fair game. Otherwise, cheers and see you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All right, listeners, I had a nice pithy joke open for uh, this podcast, but uh, our, our Zencaster software has been so bad that I want to light myself on fire. And I'm wondering which circle of hell uh, Zencaster's last 30 minutes would have been in Dante's Inferno. Hello, Rob. Let's try again. How's it going? Hello, Jacob. Nice to see you for the first <laughs> time in, in a long time. Yeah, it's not like we've been uh, talking to each other on screens, looking at each other's faces, but not being able to uh, understand the words for the last 30 minutes. Although there's probably something pregnant in that metaphor, too. Um, geez, let, let's get started. So 30 minutes ago, when we were first outlining what we wanted to talk about on this podcast, um, you sounded a lot more pessimistic than I was expecting, because I feel like for the last couple of weeks, you've been uh, you've been my healing salve for all the shitty things that have been going on in the world, because you've been telling me things aren't as bad and things are as good. I've had my head sort of um, uh, barrel deep in oil research this week. So I come up for air and you're telling me the Chinese reopening looks bad and European inflation numbers look bad and even some U.S. macro looks bad too. So there you go. I, I teed up the the grapefruit for you. Take that first question wherever you want to go. Well, I wouldn't say bad. I would say that the way that we approach things is we have a thesis and then we test it, right? So we look for evidence That's against our thesis. And what I would say is in the last week or so, I've noticed a few things that make me question our thesis and maybe kick it a little bit. I'm not sure if it's broken. Um, In fact, it's certainly not broken. Uh, But this is the right approach to take. So let's focus on what isn't supporting our view. Um, And just as a reminder, our view is that growth in the U.S. has been re-accelerating and is probably going to surprise to the upside. Um, I think we've kind of been with the consensus on Chinese reopening and the growth uh, uh, bolus that's expected to come from that. And um, the two things that have caught my eye in the last week are, you know, let's start just with the US because that's sort of the simpler one. Um, So again, I say this all the time, but one of the benefits of doing actual company research and being in the weeds on businesses and what they're doing and what they're saying and the data is you get little uh, snippets like this that really help your macro view. 
So we follow a lot of consumer companies. Uh, one of the companies that we have been uh, short um, or recommending as a short for our investment manager clients is a company called Grocery Outlet. And they're a, a very discount grocery uh, concept, mostly in California. And their whole business model is cheap groceries, less selection, cheap groceries, very simple. Um, the thing that caught my eye about Grocery Outlet is for quite a while, um, the bulls who've been wrong um, uh, on Grocery Outlet have been arguing that the U.S. consumer is screwed, especially lower end consumers. And we're going to see Grocery Outlet benefit at the expense of other more expensive grocery stores as consumers trade down to the cheaper option. Hmm. And that had not materialized at all. And um, we were short grocery outlet for other reasons, but that had not shown up until um, we started to see, you know, there's these alternative data providers where you can see sort of advanced readings on credit card data and stuff like that. And that data started showing that in February and March, uh, same store sales at grocery outlet really started to accelerate a lot. And I go into this specific company, I know our listeners are not, you know, caring too much about that. But the reason why that matters is because the extended SNAP benefits for uh, consumers in the US expired at the end of February. And that seems to be the canary in the coal mine that a lot of US consumers, and just to put it in context, I don't have the number in front of me, but something like 30 million US households use SNAP and receive SNAP benefits. This is not a marginal thing. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a pretty strong data point that all of a sudden you're seeing wallets get crimped and people are indeed starting to shift to cheaper uh, grocery options and cheaper retail options, which would be a big change from what we've seen. Because so far the consumer has been really resilient, even on the low end. Um, so that's a big change when you think about where the U.S. is in the economy. Um, and that's a very preliminary thing. And as I said, the canary in the coal mine is just a little tiny data point, And you really want to see this confirmed. But that's something that caught my eye uh, for sure. Um, moving over to the China side of the equation. Um, this is really something that, again, one of my old tropes is not only do you benefit from looking at companies, but you really need to watch market prices because market prices tell you a lot about what's happening and what's going to happen and what people think is going to happen. Um, if you're trying to analyze the economy, watching markets is one of the best things you could do because it's a real time gauge of opinion. Yeah. Um, so with that said, the two things that caught my eye uh, in the last week or so were First of all, you know, we've talked about Chinese junk bond prices. Um, I think we talked about them in December and how they were really ripping and rallying. Um, Chinese junk bonds and these indices include a lot of the property developers, by the way. So like Country Garden, guys like that. Uh, uh, those prices had gotten walloped. They bottomed at the end of last year and absolutely ripped everyone's face off, rebounding as this Chinese reopening narrative got going. And the thing that caught my eye is that now that's really starting to roll over again. So the overall Chinese junk bond index fell as low as 160 uh, at the bottom last year around Thanksgiving. It rebounded back to 250. And since then, which was in early February, so seven weeks ago, it's fallen back to under 230 again. Um, you don't want to see that bleed out very much more than this. Uh, that's a that's a worrying sign. And if you look, it's not just the property developers either, because their bonds have started to roll over for sure, and they're the most volatile. But it's also uh, some Chinese bank bonds um, have rolled over as well uh, in the last few weeks, and things that aren't really a direct property market issue. So that's worth noting, and that's a little bit worrying. Um, 
The second thing is that Chinese equities have, have basically done the same thing. So if you look, everything rebounded at once at the end of last year. Chinese equities led the way. And now uh, a lot of those assets are, after pulling back in recent weeks, are trying to rip again and make a new high. So copper is almost back to its highs. And the euro is almost back to its highs. All these things that really got going with the Chinese reopening story. But Chinese stocks are not close to their highs. Chinese stocks have zigged while everything else has zagged. And the same goes for Southeast Asia. So if you look at like Thailand, Malaysia, um, equity markets like that, they look really bad in the last few weeks. So, you know, I think the theme here without getting too bogged down in charts and details is canaries in the coal mine have me worried. Um, and I'm trying to really get a sense for, are these expectations for Chinese reopening, are they starting to be a little disappointed? Is the early data starting to come out showing that Chinese consumers really are a little more cautious than people expected? Yeah, there's a lot to tackle and, and break apart there. And I, it's so hard to talk about China because I was reading, um, I really like China Beige Book and everything that China Beige Book puts out. And I was reading some analysis that, um, that they had outside of the paywall. And um, they, the, the analysis was basically talking about China's reopening and saying, well, actually, the China reopening is so good that now we're having the debate between is this organic consumption that the government doesn't have to support that much? Or is the government going to have to come in with fiscal stimulus and the bazooka and prop everything up? And the ironic thing is you might actually be getting organic growth in consumption that the Chinese consumer is just sort of doing what a normal consumer market would do. But that what's happening is that that's going decently enough where the Chinese government is like, well, do we have to whip out the bazooka quite now? Can we like kind of have a sense of where things are going first before we, we engage in the sort of narrative again? Um, so I, I think it's one of these things where, yes, it can be disappointing on one level, but it's disappointing because it's actually maybe doing better than people thought. Um, and then the other point, I, I've made this macro point, I mean, several times, um, and it also, I feel like history is also sort of starting to repeat itself because if you go back to last June, last June, the White House was leaking to Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal and everybody else that the Biden White House was thinking about taking down some of the Trump era tariffs on China on a temporary basis. They were thinking about inflation. They thought maybe some kind of modest temporary trade accord with China would be a good idea in the grand scheme of things. And a month later, Nancy Pelosi goes to Taiwan and the whole thing falls apart and you get new Chinese companies on the entity list and we're going to shut down cooperation on climate and this, that, the other thing. And it's taken about six months for US-China relations to get back on to where they're even talking to each other and things are normalized again. And here now again, we have Taiwan's president coming to the United States, visiting. Um, she says she's visiting as a private citizen, but she's going to stop in LA and apparently meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. And China's already out saying, this is an attack on our sovereignty. We're going to respond. Um, and I, the point I've been making you know, for the last couple of months is, okay, China has survived COVID. It has survived the real estate crisis so far, but now it goes into an accelerated trade war with the United States because the United States is doubling down on all of these important things that the, that the Chinese government is expecting will propel the Chinese economy on a macro level going forward. So how does that work? You're sort of out of the frying pan and into the fire. So even if you got a good sort of reopening in general, um, things wouldn't play out well. And I guess the, the last point I would throw at you is um, you know, we talked, I guess it was two weeks ago, we talked about Silicon Valley Bank and you were talking about how we tend to fight the last war and everybody's still fighting the banking crisis last war. I think that might be true in macro too, because the last war for the last 30 years in macro has been China consumes and everybody else sells to China. And I think that model's broken. I don't think that's how the world is going to work anymore. If that multipolar thesis that I keep banding about is right, uh, things shouldn't go that direction. We need to see consumption actually from other parts of the world. Like Latin America needs to stand up and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia need to stand up. And if you're just betting on China carrying the market, just at a fundamental level and at a political level, that's not going to work so much anymore. So I don't know. Th those are some thoughts. I, it's sort of tap dancing off of what you said. That's yeah, a tricky thing about Chinese consumption. Um, because at some level, yes, a lot of countries have 
gotten rich selling stuff to China. But at the same more structural level, um, one of the biggest problems is that China doesn't consume enough, which is why they have a perpetual current account surplus. And, you know, this whole issue of excess savings and rebalancing the Chinese economy where consumers keep more of what they more of what they produce and, and use that to consume. Um, well, I don't know. Well, well, can I, is it that they don't consume enough or that they don't make enough things themselves, that they're importing things from abroad? Because they consume enough to support the global economy for the last 20 years, no? No. Um, if you have a current account deficit, you're producing more than you consume by definition. I'm sorry, current account surplus. Um, you're producing more than you consume. And I mean, we don't have to like rehash the whole Chinese rebalancing argument because we did a, a, a whole podcast on this back in August that people can refer to. Um, but the ultimate issue in China is that household incomes are too low. Households don't keep as much um, relative to other places of what they produce. Um, Corporate profit margins are too high. Government uh, uh, takings are too high, especially local government. And that's why you have consumption, even though it's very high in China, because it's a, it's a very large market. And especially for commodities and certain things that are very high profile. You know, if you want to look at copper, yeah, of course, it's, it's been a consumer boom. But as far as actual overall consumption, they've been under consuming. They've been producing more than they consume internally, which is why their current account deficits are still at all time highs, which is pretty extraordinary when you think about how huge they are now. I don't think you've ever had an economy that was so big relative to the global economy that ran such large current account surpluses. Um, so, you know, that is a structural issue. And in order to fix that, you need to put more money in the hands of Chinese households. But in order to do that, you have to do it at the expense of Chinese businesses and Chinese local governments. And those guys have some clout from what I understand. So the transition is very difficult. Um, and that's, you know, that's the structural rebalancing issue. And that's not going to get resolved anytime soon and, and maybe never, because they're not really making any signs of attacking that, um, which is, which is bad. Well, that, that was sort of my point, though, about fighting the last war. And, and maybe I didn't say it perfectly, but like for commodities, yes, China has been consuming. And I feel like the expectation or the narrative has been, OK, as the Chinese middle class rises, we will go from selling them all of this copper to selling them all of these iPhones and all of these cars and all of the like Western companies. If you, if you still look in their forecast, if you still like actually read what their expectations are and what they're projecting for you know, consumption in East Asia, that has been the thing that they're expecting. And you're exactly right. China um, produces more than it consumes because it produces for the world. It has been the world's factory. I, I, I forget how much what the percentage is of the world's umbrellas that China makes. It's something like 71% of the world's umbrellas that China makes because we all need umbrellas and nobody's going to make them. So China's going to make them. But if China's going to try, however imperfectly, however disjointedly, however much they have to clash with the local governments to say, eh, like we don't want to make 70% of the world's umbrellas anymore we'd like to make you know enough umbrellas for chinese people and then we'd like to start you know messing around with artificial intelligence and cool semiconductors and all this te and green technology and solar panels like that's the stuff that we actually want to export go to bangladesh or something if you want to make umbrellas but i th that's the sort of new macro environment that we're in but then you put on top of that the U.S. and China were locked in a big trade war. Like they, the United States is doubling, tripling down on the trade war. So this this world factory is not actually working. And so you've got like the the whole Chinese reopening thesis in some ways doesn't make sense because okay, so what if they're reopening? So they're going to consume more commodities. It's not actually going to give life to the global economy if the United States and China are butting heads the whole time. Is that a, is that a better way to say it? It is, but I'm not sure that the data supports it. So like, and I think Marco has made this point in the past when he's been a guest on the podcast. If you look at U.S. imports, they're higher than they've ever been, including from China. So we're in a trade war, but how much impact it's having on the ground is not totally clear. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm look so I'm looking at the chart right now. Um, in February, the U.S. imported 63 billion uh, of consumer goods on a seasonally adjusted basis, which is, um, you know, just to put that into context, in 2019, so pre-COVID, uh, it was about 55 billion in the same month. So our imports are up. Um, you're not seeing that trade war necessarily change the underlying dynamic of things. And it's not clear how much tariffs will. Maybe you need significantly higher tariffs to move the needle on that. Um, but we're, we're sort of locked in this embrace. And it doesn't appear to be loosening that much, even though we hem and haw and, and yell at each other about Taiwan and, and, and that sort of thing. Well, then that raises the other issue then, where if that data is true, then maybe it's the market that is lying to us. And I mean, Chinese equities are sort of their own, I mean, they have their own idiosyncrasies. It's certainly not as, de like, um, like the Shanghai Stock Exchange is not as developed a market as the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange or all these other places. The reason that Chinese citizens invest in real estate over Chinese equities is because they trust real estate more than Chinese equities. In some ways, Chinese equities is you might as well go to the casino in Macau rather than put your money on the Shanghai stock exchange. So, I mean, and this has been the other part, like we've been right at a geopolitical level about what the Chinese Communist Party was going to do over the past couple of years. That hasn't translated one to one into picking stocks because the, you know, um, when Western investors are looking at China, they're looking at it through ideological lenses or political lenses or these sort of old globalization lenses, if you haven't sort of latched onto the narrative, whether I'm right or wrong about that. So maybe there's some disjuncture between Chinese equity prices and what's actually going on at the economic level. I don't know. You can see, you can, well, the listeners can't see us. If you go on YouTube, you can see us casting about and looking confused at each other, trying to find some kind of path to clarity here. But, uh, Hey, we're, we're all in the cave with you, right? Yeah. But, um, to, to light our way forward there a little bit, um, you also, and this goes back to actually what you were saying about um, when you started off talking about, what was the name of the the grocery company that you mentioned? Grocery outlet. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've been seeing and that has been bothering me, and I've been mentioning it on the podcast and in the sit rep, you know, the last couple of weeks, when you look at these inflation figures that are starting to print a little bit higher than folks are anticipating, energy's down. It's food that is remaining stubbornly high and even increasing um, so you mentioned, you know, European inflation figures when we were getting ready for the podcast. And I actually hadn't looked at it closely because I was so focused on energy this week. But uh, in, in, say, Germany, where inflation figures surprised again, they were higher than, than expectations, energy was way down. It was food that was up a little bit stubbornly. Um, and uh, you know, th there's something in that. Like, I, I've, I'm not as confident that food prices are going to go up sort of in mass the way they have the last two or three years. Um, but when you think about the impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war and everything that's going on, like that is that is the place where I think things are a little bit tougher. Um, and usually, higher food prices lead to pretty combustible um, political environments. Yeah, I mean, food and labor is the other mm -hmm. big issue because really, it's it's consumer goods and services, especially that have been surprising to the upside in Europe. So Germany released its uh, consumer price inflation figures, which beat to the upside this week. Last week, it was the same thing with their PPI figures, which lead consumer prices. So you can see there's no obvious turnaround coming on the horizon. Uh, Spain released its figures today. Those core PPI or CPI numbers, so X food, X energy, uh, also beat expectations and accelerated a little bit which is concerning. So this is a big narrative right now, and, and this is getting back to what we started with, which is this reopening narrative and how everything international, everything emerging markets, everything foreign currency started to rip at the end of last year. Well, um, part of the reason why the euro is rebounding again, after pulling back, is that investors are betting that the ECB is going to be more hawkish on interest rates, that they're going to have to really um, sustainably increase their interest rate hikes and keep them there because they face more of a structural shortage of labor and more, you know, ongoing bottlenecks than previously assumed. 
Um, so that's a big a, a big question in the markets is is the euro going to start moving in a different way from all of those other international assets, which are now starting to, as I said, be the canary in the coal mine and suggest that maybe the narrative is shifting to something new. Well, and where are you on that? Because you, you've been skeptical of the euro now here since the beginning of the year and the timing hasn't quite lined up. So do you feel like at least that part of the thesis is working in your favor or is this a, a different a, a different thesis entirely? Um, so my current thesis right now, and just for the background here, so in our tactical macro strategy, um, we've, we've tried shorting the euro a few times this year and taken it off, gotten stopped out, like dancing around it. Um, that thesis has not changed. Um, my current sort of thinking on this is um, that I think this is a, a, a good opportunity to short the euro as it's testing the highs here um, because really two reasons. Number one, we still have this thesis about U.S. growth surprising, about the Fed being more hawkish than people assume. Right now, people are assuming the Fed's going to be more dovish because of Silicon Valley Bank and macro slowdown, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then on the other hand, if those Chinese assets really are the canary in the coal mine and international growth is slowing and Chinese growth isn't going to accelerate quite as much as people thought Chinese demand growth, then that's bad for international assets. That's going to be good for the dollar because when the international growth story starts to lag, that's when the dollar usually outperforms and when foreign currencies underperform, including the euro. Mm -hmm. um, so putting those things together, I know it's a little disjointed in, in the way I explain it. Um, I see a lot of things lining up for the euro, which is currently you know, trying to get up to 110. I, I think the euro could be flirting with parity within a few months. <laughs> um. I guess this is also, I mean, because so much of this goes back to China. I feel like we start talking about something and then we you know, go down the conversation a little bit and then it goes back to China as well. Because um, it's funny, I, I continue to be, I continue to look at China and it seems to me like the reopening is going okay. Like, as you said, like copper, they're consuming energy, they're consuming above a 2019 clip. You put in the knowledge platform before we got on the call or before we got on the podcast that um, air travel increasing relative to, to sort of 2019. And one of the confusing things about China's reopening is that you haven't seen it reflected in some key variable. So I, I won't step on the oil thesis that is on the knowledge platform and in the in focus pieces that we're putting out. But the one thing I would just say, and, and this is this is not just true of China, it's sort of at a global level, if we're talking about energy and food, I wonder if we're discounting the importance, first of all, of the European and American price cap on Russian oil, I wonder if that is actually creating um, a ceiling on the price of oil and the price of oil that we've been seeing over the past couple of months. It's not that the Chinese reopening is failing. It's that China has access to cheap Russian oil. And as long as it has enough access to enough and it can sort of get oil at a discount to whatever the market is charging. Uh, so it's not going to show up in global markets, even as Russia has displaced Saudi Arabia as the top source of Chinese crude. And they're importing more and more and more sort of every month. And I wonder if that also ties to food. Because that Black Sea grain initiative, where the Black Sea is being kept open so that Ukrainian and Russian, you know, wheat and corn and sunflower and soy exports can get out of the Black Sea, um, the if that disappeared, and you know, on on March eighteenth or nineteenth, when that deal was up for renegotiation, the Russians said, "Okay, we're going to extend it for sixty days," which technically wasn't in the deal. They were supposed to extend it for ninety days, or the deal wasn't going to work. So, what's going to happen in sixty days? Is the deal going to still be in place? Are the Russians going to pull the lever again? Um, is Turkey going to have a new president and they're just going to force it through? I don't know. But it is also this thing where the Black Sea Grain Initiative is keeping energy prices, uh, excuse me, is keeping food prices and especially grain prices down. And if you got rid of that sort of, which it is, it's an artificial mechanism because if Ukraine and Russia are fighting a war, like the Black Sea shouldn't necessarily be open. If Russia decides to go start bombing, say, Odessa uh, or some of these grain um, ports in Ukraine, could you see a big upward rise in grain prices, which are actually being kept down? So all of which is to say um, this thesis that I'm, I'm groping towards is that um, maybe geopolitics is obscuring some of those usual commodity prices that we usually use to try and figure out what's actually going on in China or what's actually going on in, in these markets. Maybe China's reopening is great, 
but because of geopolitics, it doesn't look great in oil markets. How, tell me if you think that's nuts, because that's that's my working thesis right now. Honestly, oil markets are a bit of a puzzle me, to me right now, um, and I'm not sure exactly what drove that big drop that we saw in the last few weeks, whether that was some technical factor, whether that was demand driven or supply driven. The, I guess the, the one thing I would think about is, so China has been buying a lot of cheap oil from Russia, as you pointed out on the knowledge platform, and they've been really accelerating that, um, and buying a lot of oil from them. Um, I don't know if that's to what extent that's displacing you know, oil that they'd be buying from other markets or whether it's incremental because I haven't seen those numbers. Um, but it does seem, it seems a little suspicious to me that at the same time that Chinese junk prices, junk bond prices are starting to kind of roll over a bit, that's when you see this sharp down move in oil. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if those are connected or not, but it does, it's, it's an awful coincidence. Um, and, and the thing about the reopening and, um, but we can get into commodity prices in connection with this, I think, because especially around uh, pork and pigs and mm-hmm. African swine flu, or African sp- swine fever, I think this is relevant. Um, but the thing to remember is like markets are always forward looking. So markets have priced in a pretty extraordinary Chinese rebound, and they priced it in several months ago. So now everyone's waiting to see. What's actually going to happen when the rubber hits the road? Mm-hmm. So like China Beige Book itself put out some stuff and th- those guys are really good earlier in the year saying, you know, look, forget about January, forget about February, not until March and April are you really going to see data that matters. Yeah. And the real expectation for Chinese recovery is more like June, July. Like that's when things should be really booming. And we don't really know yet what's happening, but the early signs. I just find a little bit worrying, right? So that data that you mentioned about the flight volumes recovering. Now, this is something we've been focused on a lot because we've done some work around air cargo and bottlenecks and Azerbaijan and all this sort of thing. Um, and what's happened there is, you know, the number of flights in and out of China obviously fell by a lot during uh, the COVID lockdown period, like 50 mm. or 60%. Yeah. Uh, or more, uh, depending on where you're looking. And um, now you are seeing a rebound. So in pl- someone like somewhere like Beijing, the volume of flight bookings, so forward bookings, not actual flights, but people booking flights, right now in the first three weeks of March, this is according to the South China Morning Post, is about 90% of 2019 levels, hmm. which is pretty good, you know, like, yeah, that's that's a big rebound from that depressed level where it was. It's not extraordinary. It's not two hundred percent. Yeah, you know, I don't know if that's a realistic expectation, but given the sheer amount of pent up demands that people have been talking about and speculating, and oh, there's you know a trillion dollars of excess savings, and everyone's been locked up for two years, it, it's okay, you know. And and the thing that catches my eye and maybe someone who understands what's going on with uh asian airlines can can chime in and and tell us what's actually happening here but it was really noteworthy because the prices so the same south china morning post article noted that the prices on bookings for april were down 80 percent for international flights from march to april so if you booked a flight from beijing to tokyo in march it's now 80% cheaper for that same flight in April, Hmm. which, okay, there's a lot more flights now. So there's a lot more supply that kind of makes sense. But part of me wonders, like, did these airlines plan their capacity schedules thinking they were going to have like the revenge spending dynamo, just blowing things out. And maybe it hasn't been quite as good as they, as they expected. Um, that's sort of what I'm getting at because it's all about like the underlying numbers don't really matter if for financial markets, it's all about what are the underlying numbers relative to what people expect them to be. Right. So in that sense, like those things worry me. Uh, I, I wonder like, 
yeah, you'll get a, re- a recovery. Like mathematically, it's impossible for things not to recover very strong in China. But if you don't get a bonanza, then you can have a problem on your hands for market prices and expectations and commodities and stuff like that. Well, and I, I think that's the real hinge in terms of oil because you would like you need the bonanza to materialize for China to not get a discount from Russia. You need there to be so much demand in China that there is no discount, that they have to go out in global markets and say, okay, we're going to take anything else. Because right now, it's something like a 7 or $8 discount a barrel, if you believe Reuters. Now, that's down from 14 or $15 a discount barrel from just earlier in this year. So the discount has halved in the context of the Chinese reopening. But you're going to need, as you said, sort of a lot more... Um, a lot more consumption there. And it's not just the China story. I mean, China is, of course, the most important. But um, you know, India is also part of this. India is the other country that is talking to Russia, too. So are you getting this weird thing where India and China are starting to butt heads because they want access to the cheap Russian oil? The Russians don't want to sell the cheap Russian oil. So they're now cutting production over and above what OPEC has cut. Like Suddenly, you start to get into this situation where in the short term, energy prices might look really low. But th- this is sort of my, I guess I didn't, uh, I'm glad I got to this point because I, I should have just said this instead of uh, groping around for 20 minutes. That's the previous war. The previous war is, oh, China consumption reopening. It might be, no, there's this weird market dynamic where as long as the Europeans and the Americans have a $60 price cap on Russian crude, that's the hinge. Like that's the thing that's actually going to determine energy markets and don't look to Chinese consumption for that particular thing. Let's look at other indicators in China about consumption, which is maybe a nice segue to um, our last topic and a more optimistic one, which is Brazil. Because this week, uh, uh, well, Lula didn't go to China because he, he apparently has pneumonia. As an aside, here's a joke for you Brazilians out there. What is the difference between Lula and Bolsonaro? They are both crazy people who say crazy things, who try to interview with the central bank and seem to get sick at the most inopportune times. Like I feel like I'm in, a, in, a, in an alternate universe here. But anyway, a bunch of Brazilian farmers are in China this week to try and sell their corn and their soybeans and their beef and everything else to the Chinese market. Um, So they at least are thinking, hey, there's a big opportunity here, especially as China and the U.S. are locked in this trade war. Maybe we can get into the Chinese market and sell in general. I say that to set you up because I know that you, you know, despite everything we just said, we've talked about, you know, stress on emerging markets and the dollar getting stronger if some of these canaries in the coal mines are right. But you're feeling good about Brazil. So is Brazil, why, why are you feeling good about Brazil relative to the other things that you talked about earlier? Well, Global growth notwithstanding, Brazil has these tailwinds that are just very, very strong. And you can see that in the data. So just in the last week, two pieces of data came out. The first was consumer confidence in Brazil, Mm -hmm. which is rebounding very strong. Um, Let me see if I have the... uh, There we go. So consumer confidence in Brazil is back to 2019 levels, and it's way elevated from the middle of 2022 even. So very, very strong rebound there. And the other thing is FDI, foreign direct investment in Brazil, has accelerated in a major way in the last six to eight months, and that's still happening. So in the most recent month, FDI came out and Brazil got six and a half billion dollars in February alone, um, which is, you know, coming against very difficult comparisons, but still way above their longer term average. So, like, really, things are things are booming in Brazil, and everyone hates it. And that's mm-hmm. that's what catches my eye. Um, so, I like Brazil aside from their opportunity, as as you pointed out, to uh, to sell commodities and to expand, especially in agriculture, um, what they're doing with wheat and rice and uh, kind of some of these newer ventures that they're that they're pursuing. Well, it's it's actually very interesting to follow the money right now when it comes to foreign direct investment. So I had this moment where um, I'll, I'll make a pedantic point here for a second. Anytime I start a new pr- project, whether it's a research project or a consulting report for a client, or I'm trying to sit down and you know learn something new, I try and I try and write, I write down all of my preconceptions on a sheet of paper and I stick it on the wall in front of me. And then I look, you know, I start looking at stuff and try to look at it with fresh eyes. And I keep the sheet of paper in front of me so I know what my preconceptions were and where, when I can start to see things that are clashing against them. And um, I recently was doing some research on Southeast Asia in particular and on 
Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, and those different countries and sort of much more from sort of a manufacturing perspective, but you have to integrate macroeconomics and investments in that when you start looking there too. And my assumption was on my little piece of paper, Indonesia has underperformed in terms of foreign direct investment for years, for decades even. They have wanted to attract investment and they've never been able to do it. They've always been beaten out by Malaysia or by Taiwan. It was never the market that you wanted to go to because there was political instability and they have really complicated infrastructure and it's not, you know, it's not really a nation state because you have all these islands, et cetera. Uh, when I looked at the FDI data for the last couple of years, that switched. My preconception was wrong. So they actually did double the FDI that Malaysia did. And I, I bring that up because I wonder if you're starting to get the profile of an emerging market economy that's going to do better um, in this more competitive world that we're talking about. The reason Brazil, at least at the fundamental macro geopolitical level, looks good is because they can be self-sufficient in a lot of things. Now, not everything, like one of the reasons Lula and Bolsonaro both had to be, both have to be nicer to Putin than maybe they want to be is because they need Russian fertilizer. They, they can't have Brazil's agricultural sector boom if they don't have access to fertilizer. And you know, for better and for worse, they are right now dependent on Russia and Belarusian fertilizer. So you're not going to get Brazil to sign on to, to um, you know, sort of anti-Russia uh, initiatives in the context of the Russia Ukraine war. But generally speaking, when you compare Brazil to most other countries, they have a lot of great resources. They have oil and they have hydro and they can grow lots of things and they have lots of farmland. They can vertically integrate in lots of different ways. They have a large country with young demographics and you know labor that you can throw if you want to have new manufacturing products. Um, Indonesia is very similar. Indonesia is a country that has lots of its own commodities. It's actually been banning the export of some of those commodities like nickel because it's saying to Chinese companies or to Tesla, hey, if you want our nickel, come here and build a nickel processing facility. We don't care what it's going to do to our environment. We want to make the batteries here. We don't want to just ship you the nickel and you know we're going to be um, you know, one of these uh, countries that gets tied to commodity prices in general. And I wonder if that's the profile of an economy that's going to do better here. Um, if you are tied to somebody else's manufacturing sector, yeah, like then you're sort of at the whim of that particular country. But a country like Brazil, a country like Indonesia that is big enough, has enough scale that its economy can consume on its own right, and it can push back against countries that are outside there and say, hey, if you want to be here, here's the stipulations. And because of all the geopolitical strife that's happening in the world, companies are going to sign up for it. So um, that's also a thesis. But I, I think in some ways, when, when you start following the money for FDI, even though, say, Brazilian labor costs they're not competitive if you compare them to Vietnam or Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia, but they do have some big benefits. They can vertically integrate. They are far away from all the chaos in Eurasia. They have some of these big advantages, and maybe those are starting to play out in a way. I think the as a thesis, it's very convincing. Um, it's almost like these two countries, which were left in the cold in some ways as far as how people perceive them, have found themselves well placed for you know a world where industrial policy is cool again you know because like brazil is famous for um you know the, the the old import substituting industrialization approach and trying to erect barriers just like indonesia is doing to attract um attract manufacturing into domestic economy um and historically they were panned for that and it was fairly inefficient, you know, but in this world where the value of sort of stability and the value of self-sufficiency is, is increasing in the perception of, you know, global companies, global, global actors, they are well positioned, you know, and Brazil in particular is, is interesting because, um, it's almost like two countries in some ways, because if you look at Sao Paulo and parts of Rio and sort of the whole South it's an industrialized, high income, highly sophisticated, you know, a high technology area uh, with, you know, sophisticated banks, tech companies, fintech, like they are really hitting their stride in a lot of ways. And at the same time, it's tied to this big, you know, land mass and commodity producing, you know, country that's lower down the value add spectrum. So putting those two things together is pretty powerful. Well, and, and to your point as well, because this also fits with this larger thesis, which is, you know, t today, everybody accepts that Germans make great cars, and Italians make great luxury goods, right? 
that wasn't true in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, before, but, you know, World War II changes a lot of things. But pre-World War II, the United Kingdom was the, the best manufacturing power in the world. You wouldn't have wanted to have a German car or Italian sunglasses or anything else like that. The rise of Germany and Italy and some of these other countries um, as real manufacturing powerhouses happens in the context of the rebuilding of their industrial plants after World War II. And some of these countries, you know, they create specific policies that go after the areas that they have the best advantages. Uh, my point there is just, you know, don't think that just because something is reliable because it's made in one country today or because people pan Brazil's quality from a manufacturing standpoint, if they're looking there, just because that's true today doesn't mean that's going to be true in 15 or 20 years. And pr countries like Brazil, Indonesia, that's the profile of a country that can do the thing that Germany and Italy did in the 1950s and 60s, where you can take advantage of this disruption that's happening in the world and you can, you know, stake out a claim on some part of the manufacturing economy. And it's one of the it's one of the reasons it's so frustrating, I think, especially for American investors, and we wrestle with this all the time, because if you want to go buy the Brazil ETF, I think it's what, 17 or 18 percent is Vale, which is just iron ore to China. That's that's the trade. So you're not actually expressing anything about Brazil. If you go to the most common instrument you would probably use in the United States, you're getting exposure to Brazilian banks and some exposure to um, you know, Brazilian commodity exports, when really, if this thesis is right, what should be interesting over the next couple of years are manufacturers, are things that are not going to be reflected in sort of those indices. So in that, in that sense also, it's not just, I think the way that the market approaches emerging markets is, oh, we're going to buy government bonds or we're going to buy, you know, stakes in these big companies that are out there. But um, this multipolar world also means, no, you actually need to pound the pavement and find where the disruption is actually happening. It's not going to be happening just in sort of those top level things. Um, and I, that, that's a challenge for American investors. I don't think most American or Western investors are are thinking that way or even have sort of um, options for engaging in some of those. I, 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 yeah, I mean, in many ways, the Brazilian story is the services story. Um, and that gets to them having this critical mass of you know, urban areas with, you know, highly educated people who are working in tech and financial services and business services and that sort of thing, because you need a large enough body of people to have an ecosystem to do that mm -hmm. successfully. And one of the things that, you know, as I've mentioned before on the podcast that I find most exciting about Brazil is when you look at what U.S. corporations are saying, for example, there is a shortage of talent and at the same time the friction of of bringing in talent or working with talent across borders has gone down mm. because now everyone you just see them on a computer screen you don't know if they're in belarus or brazil or bangladesh or whatever um and that's a real trend that's really happening um i was just talking with a mutual friend of ours who was in kenya and he's exploring um, opportunities to do business process outsourcing uh, in, in Kenya. And he's, you know, there's a big company in Zambia that's growing like a weed because they do this. They provide talent to U.S. financial service companies, U.S. tech companies, because they can't find people to do this work. Mm -hmm. And countries like Brazil, they're in the right time zone. Um, you know, th they have the education, they have the critical mass of uh, 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 of training and, and services and big companies where people can come. Maybe they worked for Itaú Bank and then they're going to go freelance or go on their own and work remotely or they're going to work for a consulting firm. Um, that's a real thing that's growing a lot and I think it explains a lot of what you're seeing um, in these consumer confidence numbers. Um, think of it this way. Brazilian food inflation has been a major problem, as we've talked about in the past. And consumer confidence is still at pre-COVID levels and above and rising. Mm -hmm. What would happen if food inflation was not a problem? I mean, I think it speaks to the underlying dynamism and, and strength of Brazil. Um, and there's a, there's a bias, too, because I think most people like us who talk to Brazilians who get a sense just anecdotally for what's going on in the country. We speak to expat Brazilians who live, you know, uh, Boston is one of the biggest Brazilian communities around, of course. Um, but those are the sort of people that most investors interact with. And by definition, those people have left Brazil. 
And, you know, almost inevitably, whenever I speak to someone, they have a skewed negative view of the country, what's going on. Oh, it's terrible. It's going, you know, it's Bolsonaro is going to blow it all up. It's what a disaster. It's embarrassing. Like that's the narrative that you get. And I don't think it captures the whole story of what's going on there. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just close here by saying, um, you know, one of the more interesting uh, meetings that happened this week, most global meetings don't matter that much. And probably this one doesn't matter that much either, but Argentine president Alberto Fernandez was meeting with Joe Biden this week. And uh, Biden afterwards was talking about how about the historic opportunity for economic integration between Argentina and the United States going forward. Now, Fernandez is there because Argentina has a big IMF loan and they want U.S. support for not having to pay as much to the IMF for sort of managing that balance. Argentina also plays all sides. It's been batting its eyelashes at China. It's been batting its eyelashes at Russia, the whole nine yards. But um, interesting that on, you know, March 30th in 2023, after everything that's happened in the last year or two, you've got a U.S. president saying, yeah, we want to do economic integration with Argentina. This is an incredible opportunity for the United States and Argentina to come together in an economic perspective. We can leave aside, I mean, Argentina has its own host of problems, um, but there is a lot of potential there. And when you start to hear Washington talking about economic integration with countries in South America, that the United States has really just assumed we're going to be on board um, for better relations with the United States, but haven't been actually doing anything to further that, um, that was a really interesting data point. That's the kind of stuff um, that perks up my ears, but, um, you know, it's fairly early in all this stuff. And like you said, we're in some ways we're reading tea leaves. I feel like, uh, this entire podcast has been about trying to read the tea leaves correctly because there's, there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now. So, um, I think we'll keep it <laughs> a short and sweet 50 minutes for us, uh, unless you have anything else you want to talk about, Rob. No, I'm good. Reading the tea leaves is a, is a good summary. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll have to save your uh, the the original title of this podcast, listeners, was going to be uh, twenty six story pig ziggurat of death, but uh, we'll leave you with that cliffhanger, and you'll have to come back and keep listening to find out what the hell that means. So, uh, take care. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.